And joining me now, NBC News senior Capitol Hill correspondent Garrett Hake and former Republican Michigan Congressman Fred Upton. So, Garrett, first to you. Uh, I heard you this morning calling this weird. It is weird. It is weird. And it not only postpones the inevitable, but it creates twice as many challenges right now for Senate and House. It's really been criticized by both Republicans and Democrats in both parties. Yeah, I think both the, houses, I should say. I think the easiest way to think about this is the speaker took a clean CR, which a lot of far-right Republicans don't like the idea of just a temporary stopgap with one deadline. Continuing resolutions. Yep, CR. they said they don't want to do that. So we said, okay, how about we do two? And essentially split government funding over the course of this several-month period where about a third of government programs will run out of money in the end of January. The rest will run out of the money in the middle of February. Um, that's an approach that made nobody really happy. They don't have the spending cuts that Republicans Republicans like. They don't have the supplemental spending that Democrats like. But Democrats are kind of looking at this like, well, okay, this is not the least worst option here. Let's see what Republican support looks like. If it still gets us through the holidays and into the new year with the government open, it might be good enough. But we'll see that opposition, at least the public opposition to it, has been growing among Republicans since the Speaker announced it over the weekend. They've got some uh, some difficult procedural votes to pass before they can even take this thing to the floor, at least something to watch the next two days. So Clearly, they would need some Democratic votes That's right. to bridge the gap, which is exactly what, you know, got the previous speaker fired. And Fred Upton, are Democrats just saying that they might hold their nose and vote for it because right now they don't want to be in favor of a shutdown, blamed it, to sort of push the blame game down the road towards maybe later this week? Well, the Dems are meeting tonight, so we'll find out what Hakeem uh, wants to do. Already Dean Phillips, who, of course, is running for president, has said he's going to vote for it. Uh, so the Democratic that's saying, congressman from Minnesota, Minnesota. And probably running for president. Uh, yeah, no, he is running for president, right. I right. think. I think he's already given up the, the House. So, but, you know, the issue is we've known about this deadline now for, what, seven weeks. So it doesn't go regular order, doesn't have a committee hearing or a committee markup. It's announced Saturday afternoon what the deal is, doesn't go through appropriations at all. They're going to have maybe the first couple votes that think that there's a, still a good likelihood that they get jammed by the Senate. But it just kicks the can down the road till, till January. And it goes down the road. Meanwhile, you're just back from the debate. Great mm -hmm. coverage. Thank you. And now one of the major, you know, someone who's thought to be a major contender, very well liked in, among his colleagues, is Tim Scott. Yeah, that's right. I think if Republican if Republican senators were the only ones casting votes for president, Tim Scott would probably be the next president. But he never really grew his constituency much beyond the Senate lunchroom. He was not much of a factor nationally. He was a slightly bigger player in Iowa, where his campaign had gone all in in recent months. His stepping back may create a little bit more space for Nikki Haley or Ron DeSantis, someone not named Trump, to pick up some votes in Iowa. But you know, he never really caught fire nationally. His debate performances were pretty weak frankly, and did not get stronger. I think the campaign saw the writing on the wall after and, last week. And he had evangelical support, which was why they thought that that would help him in mm -hmm. Iowa. He was very well funded. He had money from his Senate campaigns. That's right. We have a little bit of him making the surprise announcement, I think, to Trey Gowdy on Fox mm -hmm. last night. When I go back to Iowa, it will not be as a presidential uh, candidate. I am suspending my campaign. I, I think the voters uh, who are the most remarkable people on the planet have been really clear that they're telling me uh, not now, Tim. I don't think they're saying, Trey, no, but I do think they're saying not now. And he's from South Carolina, which is why this really might help mm -hmm. Nikki Haley. Uh, notably, he has not said anything critical about Donald Trump nor Donald Trump about him. Could he be a vice presidential choice if Donald Trump is the nominee? Oh, I think it's certainly a possibility. I think there's a lot of folks in the Trump camp who would like to see the former president select a woman if he is up, has the opportunity to be the nominee again. But he does have a good relationship with Scott. They worked together pretty well when Trump was president. And you're right. Uh, Scott went out of his way not to criticize Donald Trump really ever. Trump returned the favor, which is rare for uh, him politically to do that. So uh, whether he is a future VP or perhaps somebody they look at for a cabinet position, uh, uh, the Trump uh, and, and Scott orbits are certainly not done with each other. And Trump is not done with presidential politics, for sure, because, Fred Upton, your party is going more Trump by the day. He and is. with each trial, well, in Michigan, it's more popular. Michigan, it's a winner-take-all. So unlike in 2016, where the top three got a third of the votes, the delegate votes, it's going to be winner-take-all. That's a number of states now. So he's, 
advancing the big time over all the rest of the field. And, you know, unless something, you know, 